in the history of economic thought or in modern economic thought. And before I start, I, what, what we can say about human action, or, or I'll anticipate the conclusion, the conclusion will be that it was really Mises' book, Human Action, that saved economics in some sense. That is, it saved Austrian economics. So what I'm going to do is to tell a story about the rise of Austrian economics, then its decline, okay? Austrian economics was almost completely forgotten, okay, during a, 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 the early 20th century, and then its revival, okay? And Mises was instrumental in almost single-handedly reviving Austrian economics through, through human action. There'll be a number of, of uh, a lot of people in the story. Um, I've put some of the names up here, the ones starred in blue are the bit good guys. The ones starred in red are the bad guys. Though they're not necessarily commies, even though there's a red star there. <laughs> and I'll refer to these names. And I'll, there might be a few others that I'll put up there. Okay. Now, there's a conventional account about Austrian economics. It's often said that Austrian economics was founded by Karl Menger. We discussed that early in the week. And that Menger had two followers, two famous followers. They were brothers-in-law, okay? Eugen von Bombawerk and Friedrich von Wieser. They, um, Bombawerk loved to argue, but Wieser was very quiet and was always putting him off and so on. But they were followers of Menger, and by the, by the 1880s, okay, they had written a number of works, and these works began to, to gain followers in Austria, but as well as in the rest of the world. By the late 1880s, uh, the Austrian school had followers in other parts of Europe, um, in, for example, the Netherlands, in Italy, in France. And also, there were followers that, that were beginning to, to, to look, look at the Austrian school in, in Great Britain and the United States. So by the, by the 1890s, the Austrian school had a worldwide following. That's not an exaggeration. It had a worldwide following. And they continued to grow in influence. Okay. Uh, world War I struck and the Austrian school, the, the, the English-speaking world was cut off from Austria during World War I. But according to the conventional story, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to show is, is, is not completely correct, the Austrian school continued to grow in influence uh, until the eight, 1930s when it was riding high. Uh, by the early 1930s, von Mises and... and his follower, Friedrich von Hayek, had elaborated a business cycle theory that English-speaking economists, both in Great Britain and the United States, believed was a good explanation for the Great Depression. So by the, the, the mid-1930s, the Austrian influence was even intensified because it really had put forth the only satisfactory explanation of the Great Depression, which most economists had claimed in the 1920s in, in the English-speaking world uh, we would never have another recession, that we were in an era of permanent prosperity. But when the crash came in 1929 uh, and the, um, the real economy began to, to suffer, uh, at that point people began to turn to the Austrian school. We say we're one of the few, the only group of economists that were saying in the 1920s that even though it appeared that we had prosperity during the whole decade, prices were stable, okay, and we um, uh, and uh, the um, real output in the economy was growing. There was tremendous technological improvement in the 1920s. New goods were coming onto the market. The automobile was being mass-produced. So pr there, there was prosperity. The stock market was going up. Despite all of these things, the Austrians were, were the Cassandras, those that were saying that, no, there's something that's going to, um, uh, we're going to have a catastrophe. So the story goes that in 1936, we were still in the Depression, and John Maynard Keynes wrote the general theory in which he claimed that the only way out of the depression was to have government increase its spending by increasing the money supply and driving down interest rates and stimulating investment and also by directly spending more through deficits, through budget deficits. At that point, governments embraced the Keynesian message because it was what they wanted to hear. Okay, governments always like to spend more. They always like to inflate the money supply. And now they were told that they could do it and benefit the economy. So the story goes that suddenly the Austrian school was simply forgotten in the mid-1930s. 
and the business, the Austrian theory of the business cycle was poured down the Orwellian memory hole. In, in, the, in the novel 1984, when you didn't like something, you just got rid of it. Okay, and it was never really refuted. So that the so it was really the Keynesian revolution that that caused the Austrian revol, that caused the Austrian um, school to to be forgotten. Now, the story I'm going to tell is is is, is much different from that. Okay. It really says that the, the Austrian school was beginning to decline by 1914. Okay, that, that really the, the Austrian school reached its peak in 1914, not in the 1930s. And that after 1914, after World War I, the Austrian school began to rapidly decline in influence. And by the early 1930s, it was already dead. That the, uh, already dormant, at least the Mengerian, the whole Mengerian worldview, how Karl Menger looked at the economy, that, that strand of explaining prices that comes from Menger was uh, pretty much forgotten by the early 1930s. The Austrian business cycle theory was still influential in the 1930s, but really its foundation in Austrian economics had, had, had disappeared. Okay, now why and how did this happen? Okay, that's what I'll we'll talk about. And then I'll show how Mises, at the end, how Mises' book, the German language forerunner, National Economy of Human Action, revived Austrian economics. Okay, at the same time that Karl Menger wrote, Leon Walras also wrote a mathematical treatise in 1874 in which he compared economics, or he um, approached economics as a theory of mechanics. Okay, in which all the magnitudes in the economy, the different quantities, mutually influence and determine one another. Okay. Human action wasn't the, the, the um, focus of, of Walras's system. Okay. It was a system of, of, of mathematical quantities. Also, there was another new approach to economics in the late 19th century. That was developed by Alfred Marshall in 1890 in his book, uh, uh, Principles of Economics. And in that book, what Marshall tried to do was to make economics much more realistic. The way he thought he could do that was to focus on the decisions of business men. So he pretty much forgot about the consumers. He used a little bit of margin utility theory from, from Menger uh, just to explain consumer demand, but the consumer wasn't the center of his system of economics. Okay? It was a business decision maker. So Marshall, what he tried to do basically was to revive the classical school. Okay? He thought the classical school basically was right, and that they had forgotten about the consumer, and that Menger brought the consumer back. So we'll use a little bit of Menger, we'll combine that with the classical school, and that would be the most realistic system of economics. Um, what Marshall did, by the way, was only focus on one market at a time. He didn't look on the economy as an overall system like Menger did, in which all the orders of goods were interrelated. So these were two alternative views of the economy um, to Menger's view. Okay, now, what happened when, after Menger wrote, as I mentioned, von Bawerk and Wieser in Austria um, saw that Menger had said something that was extremely different and valuable and that could form a new approach for economics. And they began to write articles and books in the Mengerian tradition. So in the 1880s, these two writers became very, very influential. Actually, by 1889, von Bawerk pretty much took over as the leader of the Austrian school. Now, he followed Menger very closely. Okay. What he did was to develop Menger's insights for, for explaining the interest rate and explaining capital. He had a subjective theory of interest, the theory of time preference to explain interest, the fact that interest came from, from deep within human beings. Every human action implied that someone would rather have something earlier rather than later. Okay. You would never act if, if, if you thought that future satisfactions were more valuable than present satisfactions. So that was von bon Bawerk's insight. And he, and he, develop a whole structure of capital and interest theory on that insight. He also um, developed Menger's theory of pr value and price more fully, um, bringing, uh, bringing out the implications for the prices of, of the factors of production, the higher order goods, which Menger really didn't do. I mean, he did, but he, 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 he didn't uh, fu fully elaborate the implications, and, and von Bawerk did. So von Bawerk was a close follower of Menger. Now, Wieser, on the other hand, was influenced by Walras, okay, as well as, as Menger. And what Wieser tried to do was to simply use marginal utility as a way of 
founding social welfare. He's very interested in, 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 in the concept of social welfare and how social welfare could be maximized. But what he wanted to do was to give it a foundation in individual psychology. So he looked on marginal utility as the link to individual psychology. Okay. Von Bavirk, Menger, and, and Mises, especially later on, pointed out that um, the theory of marginal utility was not psychological. It was really praxeological. No matter what your state of mind was, whenever you chose something, the law of marginal utility applied. Okay. Whether you're contemplating suicide or you're contemplating what job to take, um, the law of marginal utility was the explanatory, um, the, the thing that explained it. So they, they differed very greatly in, in their approaches. Okay, now what happened? There are four reasons why this theory began to decline. Okay, as I said, in the 1890s, it had worldwide influence. Um, in the United States, J.B. Clark was a leading American economist and worked within the theory of marginal utility and did the most to develop the theory um, in the case of explaining wages of labor, rents of capital goods, and so on. Three other economists, Fetter, Davenport, in the, or two others in the United States, Fetter and Davenport, um, were also followers. They were called the American Psychological School. They followed Menger very closely. These three men, Fetter and Davenport in the United States and Philip Wicksteed in Great Britain, wrote treatises. Okay, they wrote long books. I recommend all three of the books that they've written uh, on Austrian economics. Okay, um, Fetter's book, which is called The Principles of Economics, came out in 1910. Uh, uh, Wicksteed's book, which is called The Common Sense of Political Economy, a two-volume work I highly recommend, came out in 1911. And Davenport's book called um, The Economics of Enterprise was published in 1915. Okay. That was the peak of the Austrian school. Okay. That, these three works had brought the Mangarian um, approach to economics to its highest, um, to its peak development at that, for that, at that point. Okay. So all of these good things were happening before World War I. But one, one of the things that led to the decline began to occur in, in the early 1900s. Okay? What happened was that Bomberg went to work for government. Okay? It's always a bad move okay, for various reasons. In 1889. So he left academia. He worked in government from 1889 to 1904. During those 15 years, he um, continued to write, but not as, uh, not as much obviously, he continued to keep up on the literature. But he had a lot of work as, as a government official, and, and his health rapidly declined, okay? So that when he came back from uh, the government service, and they created a chair of economics for him at the University of Vienna, um, he said about himself, he said, um, he described himself as an old man, okay? Other observers, even though he was only 54, uh, said that he seemed older than his years suggested. Okay, even von Mises, commenting about von Bavirk, okay, who was, who was the leader of the school, said that um, I'm quoting here, um, von Bavirk could have produced more if conditions had permitted, but his physical constitution could no longer stand the hard work necessary to embark upon great works. His nerves were failing him. The two-hour seminar already taxed his strength. So he was the, lead, the, the, the leading follower of Menger. And he was beginning to decline, okay, both in health and in influence. Now, what had happened in the meantime, Menger, Menger retired from the University of Vienna in 1903, and his chair was given to Wieser, okay, who believed more in the general equilibrium approach of Leon Walras. This is a key. Okay. He believed, in fact, that you could um, use mathematics to describe the economy. Okay. He himself didn't do it in, in, in great detail. Okay. He wasn't a mathematical economist. But his, in his reasoning, his reasoning was very, very mathematical rather than focused on human action. Now, what happened was that in 1903, so he was the main professor at the University of Vienna, and in 1903, Joseph Schumpeter, a very brilliant young um, man, came into the university and met von Wieser. Von Wieser became his teacher.
And so, someone uh, talking about the two said that um, Sch Schumpeter was deeply influenced by Wieser, okay? And their ideas on many topics in economic theory bear great similarity. Not only that, Schumpeter also was very influenced by Leon Walras, okay? Especially by his mathematical description of, of the general equilibrium economy. And he called Walras the greatest star of economics. So he himself wasn't a, a, a strict Mengarian. So what happened was that, that Schumpeter in the, um, wrote two books that got worldwide renown. In 1908, he wrote a book called The Nature and Essence of Economic Science, in which he said Walras's theory was the correct approach. The mathematical approach was the correct approach. We have to explain um, prices and, and, and outputs, that is, these different quantities. Okay? We didn't need to focus on human actions. We could, these quantities influence and determined one another, almost as if a mechanical system. He then wrote another book in 1911 called The Theory of Economic Development in which he tried to explain the business cycle. Okay, but remember now, if you explain the, the economy as a mechanical system where all the parts are meshing and working together, how can you explain the business cycle? Well, he had a, a clever explanation of how the business cycle came about. Basically, what he said was that um, the economy isn't a general equilibrium. Everything is constant for a while, and suddenly there's a new technology or there's a new idea about how to organize business. And, and one or two entrepreneurs seize, seize on these ideas. They, they borrow money from the bank. Okay, he doesn't say anything about how the bank, bank gets the, this new money. Okay, they borrow money from the bank. There is inflation in the system. They implement these new ideas. Prices rise. Um, then there's many followers who, who rush in to try to follow these ideas. The cycle reaches a peak, and then it, there's a crash. Okay. After which point it goes on in a, an evenly rotating economy or a, a general equilibrium system. Now let me just say a few words about how uh, von Bawerk's, um I'm sorry, Schumpeter's work was received. Uh, for example... Wieser himself, even though he didn't agree with everything that von Bauer, uh, that Schumpeter ha had written, uh, was, was a big booster of his. He said, um, he, he, he viewed the book as an achievement of a first-rate mind. Uh, he wrote, one recognizes everywhere the richly and, 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 and highly trained mind, which is open to all the intellectual currents of the time. Schumpeter, who only got started a few years ago, may claim with justifiable pride that this book has not been written b for beginners, but pre presupposes a fairly detailed knowledge of the state of our science. Now, Schumpeter was born, I think, in 1881, and this was 1908, so he was a very, very young man of, of 20, 27 years old when this book came out. Okay. Even Val Ross, who was an older uh, economist by this time, uh, thought the book was great, called it a very handsome and important work. Now, Bombavark didn't have anything good to say about the book. He attacked it. Okay. Um, however, he continued to say that Schumpeter was a brilliant mind. He's just a little bit muddled. Okay? He's not um, thinking in the, in, in the right way, but he's very brilliant. Now, at the same time that Schumpeter was a, was a student at the University of Vienna, Ludwig von Mises also was a student coming to Vienna in 1903. And what was interesting was that von Mises was a very strict follower, or a close follower of Bombavirk and Menger. But Bombavirk seemed to, 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 to ignore Mises. And again, while he was criticizing Schumpeter, he continued to claim that he was the most brilliant member of the third generation. Menger was the first generation, von Bauwerk, Wieser was the second, Schumpeter and von Mises the third generation of Austrian um, economists. Now, what's interesting is to look at the letters that von Bauwerk wrote to um, a Swedish economy named, economist named Vixell, who was also very influenced by the Austrian school. In these letters, even though Bombaver believes that Schumpeter is wrong and criticizes him for various things, he still refers to him as brilliant, his work is great, and so on. Okay? Or rather, he, he has a brilliant mind, but his work is, 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 is a little confused. Let me just read some of the, the, uh, re, um, some of the extracts from these letters. Um, in a letter dated, in, uh, dated July 9, 1912, Bombaver wrote, quote, Schumpeter is also very young. And, of course, he could not have possibly been able to master the gigantic undertaking of his first book that he has ventured to tackle. But I considered him to be very talented. 
about his next book, the one that came out in 1911, Theory of, of Economic Development, you will probably be shocked even more. He has developed his theory of interest, which I consider to be totally wrong. Okay, so he's totally wrong on interest theory, but yet von Bawerk thinks he's great. Okay. Um, yeah, he also t uh, uh, wrote a, a bitter 60-page uh, critique of Schumpeter's book. And uh, he wrote a letter in April 1913 to Vixell. He, he alluded to the clever but insubstantial fantasies of, of Schumpeter. Okay? But a few months later, he wrote that, um, with our young economists, I'm also not in agreement. Schumpeter I consider to be the most gifted... the most gifted among them. And if he could find his way from his present sloppiness to solid and meticulous research, he could, with his abilities, make important contributions to science. Well, he wrote two books that were totally out of sympathy with Menger, that, 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 that put forth a mathematical view of the economy, and yet Schumpeter still thinks he can do great work. Okay. It's all very strange. Um, what about Mises? How, did Mises, how was Mises portrayed in, 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 Schump in, in von Bawerk's letters to Vixell? Okay. Um, Mises, in, in, in his references to Mises, he does not betray the slightest degree of personal regard or appreciation for his abilities. Okay? Despite the fact that when he was writing these letters, Mises had participated in his seminar for seven years. Um, so, let me, in a letter dated uh, April, August 12, 1912, um, von Bawerk requested that Vixell write a, a review of Mises' book, and... Um, he wrote, you have probably also recently received a book on the theory of money by a young Viennese scholar, Dr. von Mises. Mises is a student of myself and Professor Wieser, which, however, does not mean I would want to take responsibility for all his views. I've just begun to read the book myself and I'm not yet familiar with its content. So he's very neutral. He doesn't say Mises is, is a bright guy, you know, or, or, or any... Uh, there's absolutely no um, reference to, to Mises' abilities, okay, which he must have seen with, in, in the seven years that he was in the seminar, okay? Um, later, he, in a later letter, he wrote, um, in, in, in other letters on, uh, that, that he wrote, I won't quote, but basically he, 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 he talks about Mises and, and the book and asks if Vixell um, reviewed the book yet for him, but never mentions any positive words about Mises' ability. Okay. So, what does all this mean? What's the implication of all of this? The implication is that by 1914, okay, Schumpeter is seen to be the leading representative of the third generation of the Austrian school. Von Mises, on the other hand, is seen to be just merely a, uh, one of the other Austrian economists. Now, Schumpeter is, as I said, a follower of Walras and of, of, of Wieser. Okay. So already, the Mengarian tradition is beginning to die out, right? We don't... Schumpeter is not... Um, analyzing the economy in, 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 in the way that, Schum, uh, that Menger or Bombaverk himself would, would analyze the economy. He has two books that are very influential, both in, in, in Austria and outside of Austria. Okay. Uh, let me mention one other thing um, to show you the difference in, in, in the way Schumpeter and Mises were, were, were perceived by the outside world. There was a famous R Russian economist who actually, even though he was a Marxist, was not a bad economist. His name was Nikolai Bukharin. And he wrote an influential critique of Austrian economic theory, which he did understand, even though he disagreed with it. Now, he characterized Schumpeter as one of the principal representatives of the Austrian school. Okay? Um, in the same book, he referred to Mises in a footnote as, quote, one of the latest advocates of the Austrian school, and, quote, a specialist in the theory of money. Okay? So Mises was simply just, just another one of the pack, okay? whereas Schumpeter was the leading representative. Now, one other thing I want to mention about this period. Von Wieser was the main professor in the University of Vienna. Now, what did that mean? That meant that all new students who came to learn economics took Von Wieser's course. Okay? Generally, there was one economics course that you had to take, a two-semester economics course. Um, the people that were, 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 were coming for graduate work to the University of Vienna were all getting law degrees. You could specialize in economics. And you had to take the course that was given by the main professor in economics, and that was Wieser. Okay. So, what happened was that von Bavar died prematurely in 1914, and there was even um, rumors that von Bavar committed suicide, that he was depressed about the state of the world, about he, see, he and Menger both foresaw the, the outbreak of World War I, and they thought it would be the end of, of the, um, 
uh, civilization as, as they knew it. So they're very, very depressed. And Mises hints at, in one of his works, um, in his memoirs, hints at the fact that von Bavrik may have committed suicide. Okay. He doesn't say he does. He says, well, he was very depressed and so on, and, 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 and he died prematurely in 1914 or something like that. Okay. So he's gone. Okay. Menger has retired, um, as I said, as of 1903. He's, he, Menger lives on until 1921 when he dies, but doesn't do any, any important work and is not very influential anymore. I mean, he's, he's an old man that comes to the graduation ceremonies and everybody looks at him and, 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 and is impressed, but that's really about it. He doesn't really talk to many people. Um, so what do we have? After World War II, after World War I, von Wieser then is the main professor and really the only influence now. Okay? No longer Mengarian. I mean, there's no longer any Mengarian influence. The other thing, Schumpeter's two books are now widely read by the new students coming in. Now, who are the new students? The new students are the famous fourth generation of the Austrian school, led by the most famous of the fourth generation, who is, who would you say it is? Hayek, yes. Hayek. But there are others of the fourth generation. Hayek, Fritz Machlup, I'll just put three or four names up here. Gottfried von Hobbler. And, 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 and a few others. Okay, those are the most prominent. They all take Wieser, okay, in their courses. Um, Hayek calls Wieser the grand seigneur of the school, okay. That is basically the senior scholar, the grand old man of the school. He also calls him my revered teacher. Okay? And, and, and later on he says, I was a member of the Wieser tradition. Von Mises was a, a member of the alternative Bombevirk tradition. So they see two different traditions now. Okay? And, and, and Hayek is not a member of, of the Bombevirk tradition. Okay? Um, Machlup uh, says that he was my first major teacher. And, and in fact, Machlup took Wieser's course twice. Okay? Um, by this time, Wieser has written a textbook, which is really the only full textbook by w one of the Austrian economists. Okay? It's called Social Economics. At least that's how it's translated in English. Okay? Social Economics. He's written that in 1914. All the new incoming students have to read that textbook. In fact, they say that he either read from the textbook, some of the students report that he, he read, either read from the textbook in his course, or he had it memorized. Okay, and gave it pretty much word for word. So they le learned Visarian economics, which, which is a general equilibrium approach. That is, again, you're looking on the economy, it's something that is, is, is constant. Okay? Occasionally there's changes, but, but you, it's, it is not the dynamic approach that Menger forged. Okay. Also, the younger generation thinks that Schumpeter's books are great. Okay. Um, let me give you some of the remarks they make about Schumpeter's two books. Uh, Hayek refers to um, his first brilliant book, okay, his brilliant first book. Um, he also says that the ideas certainly, quote, are certainly essential enough to the understanding of the development of economic theory. Indeed, Schumpeter made a contribution to the tradition of the Austrian school, which is sufficiently original to be made available to a wider public. Um, Unquote. Hayek also says, of course, Schumpeter's two pre-war books and his essay on money were familiar to all of, the, of us of the fourth generation. Another economist uh, of the fourth generation became a famous mathematical economist in the United States. All of these economists immigrated either to Great Britain or the United States. Oscar Morgenstern. Um, makes the following remark. He says that... Um, Schumpeter's first work was read avidly in Vienna, even long after the World War, First World War, and its youthful freshness and vigor appealed to the young students. I myself remember what sort of revelation it was to me when I first laid hands on it, and like many others of my generation, I resolved to read everything Schumpeter had written and would ever write. Okay. And all the others were also influenced by, by Schumpeter and Wieser. Okay, now, what about Mises? Mises, by this time, okay, did have a position at the University of Vienna, okay, beginning in, in the early 1920s. Um, 
these students began to come into the, to the University of Vienna in 1918, 1919, 1920, and they did have contact with Mises. They took Mises' course. And it's often said that Mises was Hayek's teacher, but in fact, Mises, Hayek never took Mises' course. He sat in on the first day of it, and he thought Mises was too narrow-minded. Okay? Back then, Hayek was still somewhat of a social democrat. Some people say he still is today. Um, but in any case... They were not heavily influenced by Mises. Mises was well known for a book that he wrote in 1912, The Theory of Money and Credit. Okay? He, was a, he was a leading monetary economist. But Mises did not deal in that book with, with the overall economy okay, in the Men Mengarian tradition. So, these students saw him as a brilliant monetary economist. And also, when his book in 1922, Mises' book on socialism came out in 1922, they also read that. So, on political economy, they were also influenced by Mises. They became much more free market. But once again, on the, on the, basis, on the um, question of basic value and price theory, they, didn't, they were not followers of, of the Mengarian tradition. They followed Wieser and Schumpeter. Okay? Their view of the world, you can look, when, when they came to the United States and they began to write in English, um, you can see that their view of the world is based on a general equilibrium notion of the economy. Now, what about Hayek? Okay. Hayek certainly was uh, a general equilibrium economist uh, into the 1930s. In 1937, he wrote a very famous article called Economics and Knowledge. And in that, he said the general equilibrium view um, in which we have uh, a static economy and every, all the resources are optimally allocated and there's no entrepreneur because there's no mistakes and there's no uncertainty. In this economy, he says, this is insuffi an insufficient description of the real world. So he started to break out of that view by 1937. Um, and he wrote a series of articles between 1937 and 1945. The most famous of his articles was The Use of Knowledge in Society, which, which um, appeared in 1945. But he wrote a series of articles in which he tried to um, reorient general equilibrium theory to take account of change. But I don't think he was really that successful. Basically, what, what, what Hayek said was, um, unlike Val Ross and the other general equilibrium theorists, not everybody has perfect knowledge. So what Hayek did was to say, really, knowledge is scattered in individual minds throughout the economy. So his revision of economic theory was really not Mangarian. What he said was that the price system would get all of this scattered knowledge and convey it to the planners. But his view of the price system was past prices. That is, if the price of computers went up, then people will, per, uh, will, will, will purchase more factors of production and will produce these computers. In other words, they were prisoners of the price system. But we know, I mean, when we talked about entrepreneurship yesterday, in fact, it's not the price of cons uh, of, of prices of computers now that entrepreneurs ro robotically react to, right? That's not what determines their decisions. Okay, sure, they, they're interested in those prices, but they have to forecast what prices will be in the future. And there's no entrepreneur in Hayek's theory of, of, of economics. Okay? There are only prices guiding decision makers, almost mechanically guiding decision makers. Even though he himself says, well, prices aren't, they're not commands, they're guidelines. But still, he's looking at past prices. Whereas Mises' view is much richer. Okay? For example, what, what, what did Stephen Jobs, or Jobs, who, who started Apple Computer, what prices did he see? For P there weren't any prices for PCs. He had to forecast what, what prices would be in the future and how people would react and businesses would react to his PCs or his Apples versus the, um, the mainframe computers. All right? that's, that, that, that's within Hayek's framework, that, that, that has no explanation. Okay. Well, that's, that's my view of Hayek. Other people would, would disagree. Um, so, the upshot of all of this is that this generation, the fourth generation, already had renounced, in a way, Menger's economics, okay? the basic value and price theory of Austrian economics. So, um, in Austria itself, in the 1920s, there was, not, there was no Mengarian economics. Mises himself was still a Mengarian. Okay? One other thing. Mises taught two seminars. He taught a seminar in the university at no pay. He was a private docent, which means that he was someone who could be a professor at the university, but he was not paid. Okay. And as I said, 
Hayek did not take that course, and it was not the main course that graduate students in economics had to take. Okay? It was a seminar, and Mises really talked about things that interested him, such as socialism and, um, and money. Okay? He didn't talk about the basic value and price theory. That was not what the course was all about. But that's really the foundation of economics. He had another seminar, a, a private seminar, that he held in his offices. He worked at the Chamber of Commerce, which was an agency of, of, of the Austrian government. And every two weeks that seminar met, and Mises invited students only after they had gotten their doctorates. So when these people were, were having their, their worldview of economics form, they were not in great, a lot of contact with Mises. Okay? Their greatest influences were Wieser and Schumpeter. And, and, and indirectly Valras. Okay. Okay, so that's the first reason for the decline of the Austrian school. Okay? We could say it's Bombeverk's early premature death and also the withering of, a, of his creative powers in the early 1900s. He never really produced another great work after the great works he produced in the 1880s. Okay? Um, so it was the withering of, 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 of Bombeverk's creative powers, his premature death, and Schumpeter's great influence on the fourth generation. That was the first reason for the decline of Austrian economics. And that was already occurring in the very first decade of the 20th century. Okay? Okay, let's go to the second. Factor that led to the decline of Austrian economics. This had to do with the rise of Alfred Marshall's economics, which we call Marshallian economics. Okay? Alfred Marshall wrote, wrote his famous book in 1890. By World War I, okay, he had, his, his, his work had swept England. Everybody in England was pretty much a Marshallian. Okay. Remember, he, he, he analyzed markets one at a time. He focused on the businessman and not on the consumer. His approach was really out of sympathy with Menger's approach. Now, in the United States, we had this school that lasted through World War I, okay? It was a Mengarian school. But by the 1920s, these economists were very old. They were Bon Bavark's age, or they were getting on in years. By the 1920s, they pretty much stopped contributing to economic theory. When this school began to wither away in the 1920s, and it, they had a few followers, but unfortunately, these two men, Frank Fetter and, and Herbert J., Davenport hated each other with a purple passion, even though they agreed on most matters of economics, and they were feuding all the time. So they never really got, they never really got together and, and, and formed a school which had influence on another generation. By, 1930, by, by the early 1930s, this school was completely dead in the United States. Okay. But now, in the 1920s, th their influence was waning, um, and there was really no economic theory to replace their theory. And what happened was that Marshall's influence extended across the Atlantic Ocean and American economists began to follow Marshall in greater and greater numbers. So if you look And what happened was that Marshall's influence extended across the Atlantic Ocean and American economists began to follow Marshall in greater and greater numbers. So if you look at a lot of the textbooks in the 1920s, they really followed Alfred Marshall's approach. So the Mangarian influence is what, what I'm getting at. Mangarian influence in the United States also was um, declining. Um, also, there was some influence. Menger was pretty influential in Italy and France, and um, but once again, by the end, of, by the uh, World War One, the influence of, of Menger began to decline, and believe it or not, Marshall's influence was creeping in. So the people in, in England and France combined Alfred Marshall with um, the classical school. Okay, so they had a, 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 a sort of a combination, but it, it certainly wasn't. Paul Menger's influence that dominated their economics. The only place, so that was the second factor, okay, the powerful influence of Alfred Marshall. The third factor that led to the um, 
decline of the Austrian school, believe it or not, was the emigration of Hayek from, the, from Austria to Great Britain. So in 1931, Hayek was asked to give a series of lectures at the London School of Economics. The London School of Economics, or the LSE, okay, was the last remaining bastion of Mangarian economics in the English-speaking world. Lionel Robbins, a brilliant young economist, was, was named the chairman of the LSE when he, I think he was 29 years old, okay, in the late 1920s. Um, and what he, he had read Menger, Bombavark, he could read German, he had, he had read Mises, he had read uh, almost all the Austrians, very well versed in Austrian economics. And he began to bring the Austrian influence to the uh, London School of Economics. And he influenced other young economists there, such as John R. Hicks and Nicholas Caldorn, a number of British economists. So they were very interested in having Hayek speak on the new Austrian theory of the business cycle. So he, he came and he gave a series of lectures that later were published in book form as Prices and Production. Okay, he wowed the whole department and on the spot they invited him to become a permanent member of the department. Okay, and Hayek was only 31. So Hayek left Austria in late 1931 and went to the LSE uh, as a permanent faculty member. Okay. Now, as I said, Lionel Robbins was a great follower of Mises and Menger and so on. But when Hayek got to the London School, okay, he be, he, what he did was he introduced Leon Walras and especially another follower of Walras, mathematical economist named Wilfredo Pareto. Wilfredo Pareto. He's responsible for the indifference curves that, you, that are such a pain in the neck in uh, microeconomics. Uh, he introduced Pareto's general equilibrium system. And he influenced the very brilliant young economist, John R. Hicks. Okay. Well, let me talk about Hayek's influence. It's very ironic that an Austrian economist, an economist from Austria, was one of the leading factors for the decline of the Austrian school. Okay, let me talk uh, about... Um, Yes, about John Hicks. Now, Hicks became a very, he wrote a book called Value and Capital in the late 1930s, which became one of the first English language works expounding general equilibrium theory. Okay. And it, it's still influential today, Value and Capital. Now, here's what he said about Hayek. Um, he, he said that he had read Pareto before he met Hayek. Um, but he, he, he also declared that Hayek's teaching stimulated him to, quote, once again read Pareto. Regarding the line of work that he pursued during the 1930s, and that culminated in his famous book, Value and Capital, Hicks revealed, quote, I did not begin from Keynes. He was also a famous Keynesian. I began from Pareto and Hayek. Okay? So he's telling us that this book, this evil work, Value and Capital, um, was inspired by Pareto, which we all knew, but also by Hayek. Um, Hayek himself regarded the analysis of value theory and value and capital in Hicks's book in terms of marginal rates of substitution and indifference curves as... So this is what, what he's saying about this book, which, which um, used indifference curves and marginal rates of substitution, which is certainly inconsistent with Mangarian theory. He says, quote, this is Hayek speaking, the ultimate statement of more than a half century's discussion in the tradition of the Austrian school. What, what does he mean by that? What he means, very clearly, is that he himself is not a follower of the same tradition in the Austrian school that Mises is which is von Bavark and Menger. His goes back to Wieser and Walras. Okay. So he's correct in saying that. There's two traditions within the Austrian school. Okay. The general equilibrium tradition of Wieser and the uh, Mengerian tradition. Okay. Now, that was an important influence that Hayek had, but even worse, from the point of view of, of, of Mengerian economics, was the influence that he had on Lionel Robbins. As I said, Robbins was brilliant, but Robbins was very gullible. Okay? Robbins wrote a great book, Austrian um, Interpretation of the Great Depression. It was called The Great Depression. It came out in 1934, I believe, um, in which he shows that government inflation, central bank inflation, brings, brought about the boom in Great Britain and the United States, and um, as a result, the, uh, the recession was the inevitable result of this boom. Okay? And he called for the government to refrain from interfering and trying to pump up the economy again. 
It was a very hardcore book. Later on, he wrote a letter with Hayek to, the, to, a, uh, to a London newspaper in a response to Keynes and some of, the, uh, some of the Keynesians in which he said the government should do absolutely nothing. So he was very, very hardcore. Okay? Allow the economy to adjust. Don't interfere. Don't make prices and wages rigid and so on. Unfortunately, Lionel Robbins later, in the late 30s, came under the influence of, of Keynes and, almost comp- and cha- completely changed his mind. So if you read Lionel Robbins' biogra- autobiography, he says... I am ashamed of the book that I wrote on the Great Depression. Okay. Now, so he, 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 he was very susceptible to personal influence. Well, Hayek was also a figure that, was, that, that um, had a lot of charisma, just like Keynes did. And he began to influence Robbins. And he began to influence Robbins in a way that caused Robbins to begin to believe that there was really no difference between a mathematical description of the economy and the economy that, that the, the description that Menger gives. Okay. That really, you can learn it either mathematically or you can learn it verbally. Okay. That's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to believe that, um, and this is what was believed by Robbins, that the Austrian um, approach or Austrian theory was really a watered-down verbal version of the general equilibrium theory of the Lausanne School. The Lausanne School was, was, was the uh, university at which Walras and them Pareto wrote, okay. So let me just give you an idea of what Robbins, um, how Robbins began, um, how Robbins' apostasy, okay, it was an apostate from the Mengarian tradition, played itself out. Okay, he had written a series of brilliant papers between 1927 and 1934, okay, elaborating the price theory of, of, um, of Menger and criticizing Marshall's price theory. And in, in his great book, which I recommend to everybody, Essay on the Nature and Significance of Economic Science, um, he, he revealed that he was indebted to the works of Mises and Wicksteed, okay, and um, also argued that economic theory was based upon reality, okay, as Menger had originally claimed. Okay. And, and quoting Robbins, he says, The propositions of economic theory, like all scientific theory, are obviously deductions from a series of postulates. And the the chief of these postulates are all assumptions involving in some way simple and indisputable facts of experience relating to the way in which the scarcities of goods, which is the subject matter of our science, actually shows itself in the world of reality. So this was Menger's approach. Starting from obvious facts of human wants and scarcity, we deduce the true um, implications of of economic science. So he was a a, a dyed-in-the-wool Mengarian. Okay, after he fell under the sway of, of, of Hayek and Hicks, he began to change his tune. Okay. Um, one of the things he did was um, his syllabus in his general economics course that he gave at the London School of Economics in 1934-1935, um, he had a section called Modern Works in General Theory. Okay, and there he had all the great Austrian treatises. Von Bavarck's treatise, Wicksteed, Fetter, Clark, Davenport. Okay. But alongside of those, beginning 1934-1935, which is when he, he was beginning to um, uh, become more susceptible to Hayek's influence, he, 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 had, uh, he listed various um, works by mathematical economists and general equilibrium economists, Pareto, Cassell, and an Italian economist, Barone. Okay? And then he wrote at the bottom of the syllabus, the treatment will be non-mathematical in character. Students who wish to witness the same problems treated mathematically should attend course number 66, which was taught by Hicks. Okay, what is he saying in that statement? Well, you can learn this verbally, or you can learn the theory mathematically. Okay, half a dozen of one, six of the other. Okay, there's really no great difference between the two schools, which is the the, um, message that Hayek brought. Later on, um, in 1938, if you look at the syllabus in 1938, all the great Austrian works have dropped out, and uh, he's added a work by Hicks and, and other mathematical economists. Um, there's almost no more um, sp- special attention, let's say, paid to the Mengarian tradition. On there's a few works there by Mises and so on, but, there's, it, but it's no, no longer the foundation of the course. Okay, which is very very sad. This is a very famous course uh, in the 1930s. It really represented at that point the height of, of Austrian price theory. Okay, that, Robbins's course. Okay, so, um, this then was, was the second factor, or the third factor in the decline of Austrian economics. 
Okay. Again, ironically, an Austrian economist, Hayek, was a leading influence in the decline of the Austrian tradition in the English-speaking world. Okay. Now, let me just say, let me illustrate this. During the 1930s, Hayek did, did a great service by introducing the Austrian critique of socialism to the English-speaking world. Um, in a book, in a collection of essays called Collectivist Economic Planning that he edited, and which included Mises' article. I believe that was published in 1935. And I highly recommend these series of essays. And Robbins, in his book The Great Depression, also had a big section that was attacking um, socialism. Now, the problem was that both Robbins and Hayek, in their critique of socialism, indicated that socialism was highly inefficient, but not impossible. Okay? I talked a little bit about this when we talked about the, the um, economic calculation earlier on in the, in the uh, week. That the socialist planner would, would have a lot of trouble collecting all the data that he needed to plan the economy. But once he collected it, um, he would still face the problem of, of trying to, to put it in usable form. Uh, to, uh, there were no, no electronic computers then. He would have to um, manually solve the system of equations. But the point would be that eventually he could. But, but the quantities and prices that were spit out by this system of equations w wouldn't be the ones that reflected current conditions. So you would have inefficiency. The, the um, planners would always be behind the uh, market in, in trying to figure out what consumers wanted. But they could still figure out what consumers wanted in some sense, okay? But it would be highly inefficient, okay? Um, Mises, on the other hand, wrote that, uh, of course, the whole exercise was illegitimate because it was assuming a static economy. A system of equations can't give you any profits. It just gives you the prices and, and quantities. Um, it assumes, for example, that all the capital goods are the right capital goods. Okay? But in fact, any ca capital goods that exist today embody decades of errors that were made in forecasting the future. So the purpose of the market economy is always to transform the things that you have today in a direction that will best serve consumers. And you need profits to tell you what things to produce and what things not to produce. You never reach equilibrium. So the system of equations is totally inapplicable. Now, Mises um, never really criticized Hayek and Robbins. He, he considered them um, comrades in the fight against socialism during the 1930s. Okay? But he did... In a French work, um, point out that there was a difference between the work of Robbins and, 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 and Hayek and, and his own work. Um, let me say, quote that here. Yeah, he writes the fo uh, as follows. Hayek, too, has shown that the application of economic calculation of the equations that describe the state of equilibrium presupposed knowledge of the future valuations of consumers. But in this, he has seen only an increase of the difficulty of the practical application of those equations, instead of seeing a fundamental and insurmountable obstacle to their employment in economic calculation. It is of absolutely no importance at all that we view the socialist regime as a dictatorship with central planning, in which only the valuations of the dictator are relevant. So what is he saying there? He's saying, even if the dictator ignored consumer valuations and would just produce what he thinks is most valuable, even then he'd have problems. Okay. Um, the dictator, too, cannot know today how he will make his evaluate, evaluations in, in the future when conditions will have changed. He cannot know it just as the individual consumer cannot know it. In other words, the dictator can't even know the, the, the future state of general equilibrium that would be relevant to what his values are today. Okay? The dictator, too, must change everything in the economy to reach these values. And you need profits and you need economic calculation to do that. So Mises himself saw the distinction. Um, now, many economists such as uh, Israel Kirzner and uh, other economists, uh, for example, the G George Mason, Pete Betke, claim that, that um, in telling this story as I have done, I am um, exaggerating the difference between Mises and Hayek. Okay? Uh, but we, this, this article was recently found about two years ago, and uh, I think it's, it shows that Mises himself saw a big abyss yawning between his approach to the critique of socialism and the uh, approach of, of the others. Uh, of Hayek and Robbins and so on. Okay. So that was the third problem. That was the third factor. The fourth factor I'll, I'll quickly um, uh, review. The fourth.
The fourth factor had to do with the fact that Menger's theory, and even in its greatest development in the great textbooks of Fetter, Davenport, and Wicksteed, okay, never was a theory explaining money prices. Now, Mises wrote, as I said, wrote a book in 1912, Theory of Money and Credit, in which he, he showed how money prices, how on the one hand, the system of barter, and on the other hand, uh, monetary theory, how those two systems could be integrated, how value and monetary theory could be brought together. Okay. And Mises pointed out that it was important to do this, because remember, the information that everyone has, the information entrepreneurs have, is qualitative information. It's information of how people value different goods in relation to one another. Okay. It's information about, about technology and so on. How does the market economy, based on this qualitative uh, um, information, bring about a situation where you have cardinal numbers in which you can, can calculate quantitatively? You must have cardinal numbers. That is, the money prices. So what, what needed to be done was to integrate money and value theory so we could fully explain money prices. Now, Menger and Bombaverk and, and, and even these guys, as great as they were, were not able to do this. Okay, Wicksteed came very, very close to doing it, and, and, and Davenport also was headed in the right direction, but they did not do it. Okay? Mises pointed to how it, it could be done in his theory of money and credit, but didn't fully integrate all of economic theory. Okay? So that was missing. That was a problem. So now what that problem allowed allowed to happen was those people who believed, such as Robbins and Hicks, that, that Austrian economics was simply a watered-down version of general equilibrium theory, said, look, general equilibrium theory is a barter economy. We talk in terms of barter. We, we don't have money in a general equilibrium theory because there's no uncertainty. Okay? People know exactly what they want, so you, you never have to hold money. Okay? Um, and therefore, they haven't gone beyond us. They're just a watered-down version, of a verbal version of mathematical economics. They were able to say that, even though that wasn't true. Okay? The other problem with Mengerian economics was that Bombeverk and Menger, and again, even these guys, didn't give a clear definition of, of, of or rather, didn't, didn't give a clear idea of when it was useful to have a general equilibrium construct in your reasoning. You do need some sort of a, a construct of a static economy, of an economy in which you have um, no change. But unfortunately, it was used much too extensively throughout economic theory. So almost, well, certainly with Pareto and Valras and, and, and Hayek and so on, it, 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 it replaced a dynamic view of the economy. Now Mises, again, um, solved these two problems. He solved the problem of money, of integrating money into the system. He solved the problem of general equilibrium. Mises said that we should, we should only use the ERE, which is his name for general equilibrium, um, and he did this in, in his book, National Economy and Human Action, so we, we should only use it for explaining profits. Okay? We only need it as an image of a world in which all change and all uncertainty is absent. What we can show is that in that world, even though there would still be interest, and there would still be wages, and there still would be rent, there would be no profit. So that image of a changeless economy permits us to grasp the nature of profit. The true nature of profit is uncertainty. That the source of all profit is uncertainty and change. An entrepreneur's reaction to uncertainty and change. So Mises focused on a changing economy. He only used the, the um, ERE as an auxiliary construct. So um, what Mises did then in human action was to solve the two problems, which were the fourth reason for the decline. Okay? He explained... The, the place of money prices in economic calculation, he explained the correct and limited use of the ERE, and in doing that, he revived the Mengerian tradition. Now, unfortunately, um, National Economy came out in 1940, okay, this great work that was going to revive the Austrian tradition. By the late 1930s, um, in English-speaking economics, general equilibrium theory of Walras and Pareto had taken hold, and Marshall's theory had also taken hold. The Austrian theory had been completely squeezed out. So Mises was hoping to, to, to reintroduce the Mengarian theory. He wrote really very little else. From 1934, when he went to Switzerland, to 1940, he wrote very few articles, academic articles. Um, and before 1934, he had, had been very prolific. The reason why was because he was hard at work on this treatise. He realized that um, it was necessary in order to, to revive the Austrian school. 
when it came out, though, the world, uh, the, the world War had broken out, at least in Europe, and um, the Swiss publisher then really had no market. They couldn't sell to the German market. They quickly went out of business, and the book disappeared. By the time Mises came to the United States and issued an English-language version in 1949, okay. the Marshallian and Valrasian approaches were combined in, and, and, and given to students in the textbook literature. Okay. The reason why that happened, are, 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 um, there are many reasons for this, I don't have the time to go into them, but basically American economists be, um, all went to Washington, many of them went to Washington, they became very infected with the idea that governments could plan. Um, for specific little sectors of planning, Marshall's economics, which focused on individual markets, okay, w w was very useful, so they, became, they began to use that. And um, the, the profession also became more mathematical, and they began to use a general equilibrium system. So that by, by the 1950s, when you su and we still see this in the microeconomics textbooks today, the, the, the price theory books and the microeconomic textbooks that came forth onto the market had the first maybe 90% of the supply and demand analysis of Alfred Marshall. The last 10% introduced the Valrasian system. There was no room for, for, for Mangarian economics. Um, but Mises came to the United States, got, uh, continued his teaching, and um, built up fo a following, including uh, the brilliant Murray Rothbard. And Rothbard continued the Mangarian tradition in his great book, Man, Economy, and State, the 40th anniversary of which, or the publication of which, will be next year. And um, from that point on, there was a, a full-scale revival. From, from the early 1960s on, I would date the Austrian revival. Okay? But it could not have occurred without human action, okay? without the, 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 the monumental um, exposition of Austrian theory that Mises was able to accomplish in human action, and, and the solution of, of the two problems that, that um, were undermining the uh, acceptance of the theory. One other point, it's interesting to speculate what, what, what um, Rothbard would have uh, been without um, Ludwig von Mises, because he, he once told, I said, well, what, before you read Mises' Human Action, because he told me he was a free market economist all along, I said, you know, what did you, um, you know, what, what sort of theory did you, of uh, the economy, uh, did, did, did you use to analyze various issues? So, well, you know, I used some Alfred Marshall just to supply and demand stuff. It was, you know,